welcome back to the show. Really glad to have you on. Uh, you are Tesla government, but you're not part of Elon Musk's empire. So uh, why don't you explain what you guys do? Yeah, yeah, that's right, David. Thanks for the intro. We are not part of Elon Musk's empire. That's true. Uh, our founder, Fred Hassani, just has a, uh, a, a real fascination with, with Nikola Tesla and uh, always felt like he never quite got his due. That Edison guy really stole all the glory. So uh, <laughs> he, named, he named his company after, after Nikola Tesla. And what we really do is we focus on building data solutions for U.S. government clients. And, you know, what's that mean? Well, I think probably similar to any industry, um, the U.S. government really has a problem of we have all this data. We're getting more. We're making more every day through every operation, through every report, through every program. What do we do with it? And, and more importantly, like what of that data is actually useful? And that's really what we do is we come in and we work with different government agencies to figure out which data is useful. How do we build data structures that can pull out those useful bits? And then we feed it into our technology, which has a lot of knowledge management, a lot of content creation, a lot of collaboration, and a lot of data visualization capabilities. So, you know, what's that look like for government, right? So... I'll give you an example. Um, we recently worked with a State Department office that is um, conducting a lot of different programs overseas. And so what we do is we help them pull out the relevant information from both all of their reporting, uh, all of the, um, the historical funding information, the proposals, the reasons like, why are we doing this program? And then you can look at the information that's coming back from the field and using the data structures and the technology that we put in place, you can see, oh, okay, these are our strategic goals. This is the reporting that we're getting from the field on this. How's it aligning? And then you can overlay that with the financial information and you look at it and you say, oh, all right, we're actually getting a lot of good value out of this. We should continue to fund this or ah, uh, you know what, we're spending a ton of money here, but we're not hitting any, any clear metrics and objectives on it. I don't know if we should continue this. So oh, quick summary. Quick little rabbit trail. You know, you work with all these different government agencies and without naming any of them, what percentage of these people, particularly the leadership, do you feel are really trying to do something um, that's good, that's meaningful versus just, okay, I got this money I got to spend, or I got this thing I'm supposed to do. Because, you know, I, I know this is a rabbit trail, but you're in a unique position to comment on this without mentioning anybody. But um, what percentage of those people are, are sincere? What percent of those people are like following their political agenda? So I got to I got to do this versus what you just described really touched me as somebody who sincerely, they have a mandate to go into a country so many dollars to spend and, and they're trying to help poverty or make more clean water, whatever the deal is, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And they're sincerely trying to do it well. Um, it's not a political agenda for them. I'm, I'm kind of curious because we're just in troubled times. So I'm sure I, I know you're all about people and teams. So I just was curious about this. You have any comment on that? No, that's a great question. And I'm, I'm really glad you asked it because I think that um, a lot of the work of, uh, of the government, people don't have necessarily a great, um, a great view or understanding of a lot of it because they don't necessarily see how the sausage is made on a lot of it, right? Um, to answer your question of the percentage, the vast, vast, vast majority of people that I've worked with uh, in government are going in every day, busting their hump, trying to make a difference and wanting to do a better job um, and are especially looking for ways and tools that they can do their job better and they can achieve objectives better. Um, especially, you know, with the, um, with the professional staff at government agencies, the career folks that 
they believe in the mission of the United States and, and they want to help the people of the United States and help the, um, the uh, further the, the US government mission. And anything that they can do to, to improve that, I think that they are, are ready and willing to do. Um, but you know, it's you're you're talking about steering a, a huge battleship, and and how do you how do you react um, agilely to that? I think that's yeah. where working with groups like us can help. Is that we can help sort of um, help government offices make those those shifts that they want to make. They want to be more effective. Uh, you know, that actually makes me feel really good. So I, I didn't know what the answer would be. I didn't expect that one, quite frankly, you know, because we just get so mm -hmm. much stuff thrown at us and government gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And there are definitely issues with government, which I'm not going to waste your time on. But um, but but just to hear that there are people there that are are looking to do a great job. And I know you're all about teams and collaboration. And I'm really excited that your company is helping them try to find truth, you know, what's really yeah. working. And um, so, so I think that's great, but what type of, of success stories have you seen as you've got your people working with government people, working with whomever? I mean, these are, there's a lot of collaboration, a lot of teams going on. What are you coming away with as, as some real success stories and best practices? Yeah, I mean, I think, as a general rule, and this goes for, I think, anyone that is working in sort of a collaborative client facing consulting based relationship is you really have to put yourself in the shoes of the people you're trying to serve. Um, and I think when we've had our best collaboration, when we've had um, our most successful deployments, uh, it has always started with um, understanding what their problems are, what their pain points are, what they're trying to achieve, and then also being realistic about what their operational environments are, right? Like you can't, you can't be recommending solutions that sure, that'd be great. You know, it'd be great to completely um, restructure how you uh, do approvals of software or how you um, issue uh, foreign assistance awards. But in government, right, like a lot of that stuff is determined by the legislative branch. And so our clients are working sort of within the constraints that they're guided by by law. And so how do you as a uh, as a solution provider come in there and figure out exactly um, you know what is a viable solution given the constraints they're under? I think that's something that we as, as Tesla government are particularly good at in the government space just because we've been working in it for so long. We understand what what those issues are. But it, um, but it sounds like, Ben, it, it, if I can interrupt, it sounds sure. like that also this is something that's really a good habit for people to develop uh, professionally and personally, that we need to stop making assumptions yeah. and thinking that, oh, you know, they have the same flexibility or resources or skills that I have. And so they can do this, but there's actually a dialogue. Is that what yes. I'm hearing you say? Absolutely. I think that that an open dialogue in general is is critical to any good, you know, client relationship. Um, and I think that you hit on a really good uh, point there with the assumptions of skill sets and um, how they fit together with different teammates. Right. So if you're talking about, you know, how, how we operate is we have. On our, on our staff, sort of a multidisciplinary team. And because we work with offices across the government, what we find is that different offices will have totally different skill sets. 
you know, there are dedicated offices within the government that are fantastic uh, geospatial analysts, for instance, right? These guys make the best maps. They're like world-class ingesting geospatial data, rendering, finding key insights and analysis. Our team can do that. We probably don't need to bring that portion of our team to bear with these guys, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, that's probably like telling them a little bit about what they already know. So I think the first step in any of that is understanding the team that you're working with. What are they really good at? And what do they sort of need some help with that can let them be really good at what they see themselves as. So, so how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is understanding and asking them just directly, like, what is success to you? What do you, how do you measure your success? What key policies are you trying to pursue? And then go the next level down. What, by how by the way, for- can, can you give me an example? whether you've done this with a government agency or within one of your teams, kind of walk, sure. walk us through how that worked. Cause I think a lot yeah. of people are like, Oh yeah, no assumptions. Yeah. We want to do that. But they don't understand the step-by-step that you're starting to walk us through. So maybe if you gave them a, an example, that would help. Sure. So in the, in the government space, a lot of um, both different, Uh, high-level organizations, right? So super high-level organizations, cabinet level, DOD, Department of State, Department of Commerce, all of these, you know, um, organizations that have secretaries will have mandates, right? And they'll they'll have policies. You'll see things like the national security strategy that comes out every year. And then in that, it details out specifically, what are these organizations responsible for in that? Then from under that, there's strategic level documents that say, okay, these subcomponents of these agencies are responsible for this. And then it, it goes all the way down to, you know, bureaus at the State Department, offices at DOD. And what you'll find and what we have find found is that when you dig down in there, that oftentimes offices and these lower level components are working towards those goals. They've organized themselves in ways that um, pursue them, but they have a very hard time pushing documentation and pushing like the data that they're collecting from the field on what they're actually doing to show how they're making progress towards it. So. Um, you know, if you're working with um, a, a specific office at the State Department, you know, how do they, um, how do they collect their information so that it shows they're meeting the objectives laid out in uh, the FAM, which is the Foreign Affairs Manual that details specifically sort of like, okay, this office is, um, you know, is responsible for, you um, uh, we can say counterterrorism, economic development, and um, democracy building in X country or region. So what we can do, and I think what we try to do as part of uh, everything we do, is we start with those strategic objectives, and then we move down into the actual information that's coming in and we talk to the people who are in charge of managing that flow, are in charge of running the programs, in charge of making the decisions of how do we spend this money that Congress is giving. And we see where is sort of the um, opportunity to take what's coming in and show how you're achieving those objectives. It's interesting. And, and as you work with these teams, I noticed in some of the notes you gave me that you feel empathy is key to teams. That's not normally what I see. Yeah, I, I would say that, that empathy is 
probably um, the most important to, for me. I, I think empathy is the most important um, aspect of building effective teams. So, what um, happened in in your career? What you know, where was the pivot point, the story, the tipping point, whatever, where you decided empathy was really the key factor? It's not normally what people lead with. Sure. Yeah. Um, I would say that it was it was a process, but the biggest um, and and starkest example is when I would say I was probably first promoted in um, my last position uh, to um, covering a whole bunch of leading a whole bunch of regional teams. I was a regional team lead before, and then I um, was promoted. And instead of managing one team of four, I was managing how many? Seven teams of four. So, um, and, you know, this was one of those, one of those things where, you're the people that are promoted are often promoted because they're really good at the job that they had before, but the job that they had before is not necessarily the same job that you have now. Um, and so I, I was pretty young at this time and I came in and I was like, okay, well, I was promoted because I did a really good job as a team lead. And so, I mean, it's simple, right? Like, just have the team leads do what I would do. Like, why not? And then that'll be, and then we'll all be successful. And uh, I think this was my biggest and strongest immediate lesson in empathy for a couple of reasons. One, um, not everybody was operating in the same conditions that I was. So like, all those assumptions that you were talking about that I made about how things should work didn't work for all of them, right? They're dealing with completely different subject matter. They're dealing with completely different customer groups. They're dealing with completely different like realities, basically. Yeah. The, the other thing that, um, that you talked about before, which I really liked was skill sets, right? Not everyone's gonna have the same skill set. And so if I'm particularly good at one thing, naturally, you know, I really like, I really, really like engaging with clients. I love it. I love calling them. I love talking it through. Um, other people, you know, that, that were team leads were much better at sort of thinking through projects, projectizing stuff. How do we, how do we tackle this problem? How do we break it down? In, into discrete tasks and how do we, you know, schedule and, and move that forward? You know, I think every leader has to be good at that, but some people just have a great knack for it, right? I, my bias is much more towards understanding the client. And so when I saw my team leads that were more focused on that, I was like, you're not doing a good enough job with client engagement on that. But here's the thing is their clients loved that aspect of it, right? And so when I, when I came in with a heavy hand and I'm like, no, you gotta do this, you gotta do this. It messes up their relationships. I wasn't putting them in a position to succeed. And it was because I wasn't being empathetic and I wasn't understanding where they were coming from. And I wasn't understanding what their strengths were and what their operational environment was. It's very interesting because I teach something I call a uh, good cop leadership. So, you know, good cop, bad cop negotiation mm -hmm. style. And I teach that um, everybody can be the good cop in leadership. And a good part of that is being empathetic, but totally. the boundaries are firm. And the bad cop becomes not a person, but the goal you're trying to achieve. So it sounds like if I'm hearing you correctly, you needed to shift from the, the specific skills where you were thinking they needed to be a clone of you. Right. Whereas you needed to take a step back and take the goal they're trying to reach and then have more of a discussion of, okay, how are you gonna reach that goal? So the boundaries still firm, the bad cop of achieving the goal is the same. And the boundaries are firm that you have to get there, but you didn't necessarily have to do it Ben's, like, like a Ben clone. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And I think that was, that was such a learning experience for me because it really, 
it showed me basically exactly what you're saying, like set the guardrails, you know, get here, but then trust your people, right? Like yeah. that's the key to, to that I found in good leadership is take the time to find really good people and then trust them. Because if you don't, like, what are you doing? You can't do everything, right? Yeah. And, and honestly, a lot of them, a lot of people are gonna on your team are gonna be better than you at specific things as a leader. And you trying to take over and manage that hurts your team and takes you farther away from that goal that you're trying to achieve. What about those areas where they're weak and, you know, they may be aware of it, may not be aware of it, and you feel they, they need to bring it up? What do you do there? Mm -hmm. I love the um, concept of failing safely here. Um, so what I try and do say, um, you know, say that you have a member of your team that you really need to um, get better at giving presentations or demos, right? Find low threat ones where they can start and, you know, ones and twos where even though they're client, you know, they're client facing um, or it's with clients that you already have, but it may be, you know, um, we do software, you know, we, we build and deploy software. And so a big part of what we do is demos of software and showing people how they can use it. And so we'll do demos anywhere from like groups of 300 people that are attended by, you know, super high level government people to analysts on teams. Single analysts are like, hey, I want to know how I can use this. Find one of those opportunities that's one on one and sort of say, hey, you're leading this, you're on your own. It gives them the idea of, okay, I'm in front of, of a client. There's some stakes here. I don't want to mess it up. But at the same time, you know, if they stumble over their words or they mix up terminology about some of the software for this one person, they have that ability to have sort of a one-on-one -on -one conversation with it, laugh it off, make them feel like, okay, I can, I can continue moving this forward and it, there's not a huge cost, but it's still client facing. So, you know, you still want to get it right. Well, so I want to clarify for the audience and also for myself. So this person that you're saying, okay, it's yours, go for it. So do they have an example of someone doing the presentation well? Do they have the option of saying, I'd like to do some rehearsals with somebody? Do they, you know, what, what do you, or, or do totally. you kind of just throw them to the wolves? No, I think, <laughs> I think, I think you always need to give, um, need to give people the tools they need to succeed. Right. So, yeah. um, you know, if this was the case, the first thing I would do is I would have them, if I was their immediate team lead and I was doing demos, or if there was someone else who's really, really good, I would say, hey, attend a few of this person's demos, see, see what they do, see how they handle some specific stuff, take notes. Um, usually we'll always have sort of a set of either talking points or a deck that you can run through, just sort of arming people with stuff, right? And so they can go from a template beforehand um, that they can that they can build on, but ultimately, you know, you want to get them to to the place where the template's nice to have, it's good, but they can really take ownership of it and make it their own. Yeah. So with this empathy thing and the freedom to fail, so what about the what what about when someone fails and you feel hey they should have caught that or they should have been better prepared in that area. They didn't maybe put in the time. Yeah. What, has that happened? And what do you sure. do? Sure. Yeah. Sure. I mean, um, I think that in, that in every situation um, that you need to have um, an organization and a team where feedback is uh, is integrated just as part of everyday work. Um, and people need to feel that, um, that feedback, both going 
you know, from supervisor down, but also I'm a big believer in 360 feedback in, in sort of teammate to leader, um, that there's an understanding and sort of a cultural acceptance of all feedback is about us getting better as a team. Um, and, um, that comes in, in being very explicit about where failures occurred, um, where we uh, can get better and what we can do to get better. And you have to be like direct examples, right? If you're saying, and going back to, to, a, um, to the example of a demo, of a software demo, say of a specific deployment with a specific office and they jump right into a functional, uh, a functional description of it, but they, um, the presenter doesn't give a background of the why, of why are, did your office stand this up in the first place? Why is it important? What's the goal of it? Which happens all the time. I think it happens all the time across softwares in general and people yeah. giving software demos in general because they love the software. They're like, this is so cool. I want you to see how <laughs> cool this is. Yeah, yeah. But, but for most people, they need to, to uh, contextualize it. And what'll happen is if you don't get that, con that context, you get a bunch of questions that come up. It breaks up the flow. You don't get to hit the points you want to hit. I've had this specific situation a ton with, with um, people that are first sort of giving demos. And I always, always, always want to call out like, hey, this, it was a really good job. I could tell how excited you were about wanting to show everything. But you need to think about how a user or customer is coming to this. You need to be empathetic and put yourself in their shoes. Well, I would, I would suggest, with contact. yeah, I would suggest it goes beyond software demos. I mean, when you're in meetings with people, when you're talking with people and you're trying to get something across, um, I mean, one of the things I try to teach people is you got to think about what's that other person's interest, what's their need, what's their want, and is there a connection there? And maybe you know there is, and you can connect to that. Maybe you're not certain, but as you say, a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times, if you know you're presenting something in a meeting, you're going to bring a report or whatever. It's it's kind of good to remind the people, here was the objective why I was asked for this, and um, here's the problem, you know, and here's the solution that we're trying to come up with. So let me tell you what I found. If you tee it up, it kind of helps get everybody on the same page. Or if there's dissent, you know, because then you can say we all agree that's you know. Um, so I, I think that makes perfect sense. Perfect sense. Totally. And that's, and, you know, here's a, a case of where I received some great feedback where I did, um, this was probably one of my um, first projects where um, like we needed to reorient and, and sort of restructure things, which, and it turned out great, but part of what was happening was that we were talking past each other and um, I wasn't setting the context of, um, of what we were trying to do with them. And I wasn't sort of taking the input that I was getting and putting it in that context. And so the, the best advice I got on this is what you need to do with the clients and when you're gathering this information is listen to what they say and repeat it back to them as you understand it. Like active just listening. doing active listening, totally, right? Yeah, yeah. And like, and, and repeat it back to them and then take it to that next step. Slot what they said into what the overall context and vision is. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, cool. Hey, if they want to learn more about what you guys do, get in touch with you. How do people do that, Ben? This I'm, this is very interesting. I'd actually like to spend you know hours talking to you about what you do with your company. But um, how do people learn more about you? Get in touch with you. Yeah, so you can see us at uh, teslagov.com. Um, we're also on on LinkedIn. So 
please feel free to check us out. And people can always reach out to me uh, directly on, on LinkedIn. That's where uh, the best way to get a hold of me. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Ben. This has been great. Empathy as a team core thing. Uh, that's, uh, I'm going to think more about that. So thanks. Cool. Thanks for having me, Dave.